you had a rare leukemia due to um, all the work that you did at Ground Zero. Can you maybe talk to the experience of just breathing through those days and what that was like, being unable to breathe, being overwhelmed by all of the dust in the air? Yes, um, the, the first day, especially, um, we, we didn't have equipment. We ran, you know, we didn't have breathing apparatus and then we were handed little 69 cent hardware store dust mask, you know, those little thin paint masks that would just get sweated up and fit, you know, stick into your face within 30 seconds. So you would, you just, they were useless. And what, what you wound up feeling like was that you, you swallowed a box of razor blades because there was glass and there was cement and it was just so caustic. And, uh, I remember that night, you know, when we went back just to get some medical relief uh, for the few hours, we were walking up the hill to the firehouse because they dropped us off like a block away down at Engine 201's and quarters. And uh, one of the older firemen, as we're walking up the block, we're all struggling. We're all having a hard time breathing. And just, just I mean, I felt like I was dying, literally. It, it's, it was pretty bad. And just remember the one guy going out, we're all dead. And I said, no, no, we made it. We made it. He goes, no, you don't get it, kid. He said, we just breathed in poison after poison for, for hours. And then that went into days and then went into months. He says, we're all dead, man. This is going to take us all. And I, I, I thought he was crazy. And then now years later, like starting in 03, 04, guys just started coming down with these really rare and advanced cancers. And then it just it just stopped being a coincidence with the number of guys and they were young this one one of the first guys john mcnamara he was 33 or 34 and he came down colon cancer and it, it took him quickly in 2000 he was in 2005 and i i kind of said to you know friends and family i said i feel like i'm running through a minefield and i i wonder when my i'm going to step on my mind because everybody's going to get sick and I wasn't feeling well from 2008 on. Just I just I couldn't put a I couldn't put my finger on it, but I just wasn't right. And in 2011, uh, I, I failed my medical. Uh, my bloods my bloods came back horrifically wrong, and they pulled me off the truck. But uh, they strung me out for a month. The doctors in the fire department. One of them said my spleen was engorged because it was probably drinking myself to death, like as he said, most of the guys did after 9-11, which was pretty wrong of him and stereotypical, you know, just, just to stereotype and to categorize. And the guy couldn't have cared less. He just, he was so crude and nasty. And then my one doctor, who was my doctor on the outside, she, my blood pressure was 240 over 140. My spleen was about to rupture. She didn't even show up for my appointment. And I went down, I passed out, the paramedics responded. She got into an argument with a paramedic because for big ego and basically telling him there wasn't really anything wrong. And he's looking at my paperwork going, this guy's got leukemia. And he overrode her. He raced me out of there down to Brooklyn Methodist. And uh, the doctor, the charge physician, the ER physician, he says, you're not leaving. He goes, uh, you're in a bad way. And I said, what is it? He said, I, I need four. He goes, I need, I need a little while to figure it out. He goes, but you, you probably have one of a few different types of leukemia. He said, I'll drill into your hip, take your marrow and find out. And he said, uh, but in the meantime, we'll get the swelling on the spleen down, like a, some sort of rapid medicines and whatnot, because my spleen is about to rupture. I had no blood platelets left, which is your clotter. So I basically would have bled to death. And, uh, I found out from my team of doctors that I had about 48 hours to live. Um, and that really set me off. I was infuriated because I was telling them for a long time that I was sick. And the doctors failed you. The few doctors in the beginning yeah, failed you. I felt very betrayed and, and other guys had died. And uh, I, I, had a, I had it out with that one doctor. I basically told her she was fired from my case and she's <laughs> pretty politically in charge person and I didn't care. I, I jeopardized my my job for it because it was my life and I got the sense that she didn't, re it didn't really matter to her. She, Why, didn't, for she her. didn't have any empathy, as you say. 
it was exact. So why for her, why for a few others, was there not a, a special care, a special compassion for, first of all, all humans, but human beings in your position, especially a firefighter, a first responder. Um. You know, Alex, I think what it is in the department, their title is just to get us back to duty as quickly as possible when we are either injured or sick, because what happens then is your replacement is now in overtime. So you're out being paid on medical leave, but then they need to replace your spot and then that costs more money. So I think it's just behooves them to get as many personnel back and especially during the summertime you know they look at it like oh maybe you want a few extra days off to uh you know go to the beach and uh this one doctor he tipped his hand back as if like i was drinking an alcohol beverage he says hey busy summer because i asked him to look at my spleen which was sticking out of my abdomen like a football and i said excuse me sir i said how dare you assume that i'm i'm abusing alcohol because you know, alcohol abuse sometimes will, will present itself as the spleen is, is engorged and having an issue. So you automatically just assume that that was my situation. Wouldn't even give me an exam. And I was horrified. I was just, I was so angry. I mean, I wanted to punch this guy out. And I literally was screaming at him and, and an executive officer came in to defuse it and sent me to another doctor. And when I showed her my paperwork, she was horrified. She was like, what did he say? And she said, oh, okay, go go to your regular doctor tomorrow, who was one of the department doctors. And and she just, it was just an indifference. It was like, I don't know. I, I was shocked at the lack of compassion. But you know what? That being said, I'm past it. I, uh, you know, it, life moves on. The team of doctors, I, I ended up with a Methodist and my subsequent oncologist, Dr. Peter Mansell, uh, world class, just incredible human being. My Dr. Pete is just, I love him. I just, I love him like a friend, like a big brother, like a father, like a, uh, my, my primary oncology care nurse, Mike Nunez, was just incredible human being. And, and he knew I was frightened because I had to get two and a half years of chemo, uh, compressed into seven days or I was dead. Um, these massive bags of chemo that never stopped. And, and, uh, they they burn the minute the minute they went into your body you felt like you were burning to death from the inside out and mike when mike came in to hook me up he said um look i have to wear a hazmat suit this stuff is so caustic that if it if it drips it'll burn whatever it touches and i was like but mike you you're going to put that in my body how how the hell is it not going to kill me he says no no this is exactly what it's supposed to do trust me so when he prepped the iv tube to get it flowing, it spilled onto the tube and the tube started to smoke and burn. And I, I went, I said, no effing way, Mike, you're not putting that in me, no way, no way. <laughs> and he goes, listen, let me get another one, let me start it over. And here he is wearing a hazmat suit looking at me and I'm going, this is, this is insane. And he goes, he looked at me, he took my hand and he says, Nels, if you don't take it, you're dead. He says, you got those three kids. I, I'm sorry, I have no other option, you're dead. And I said, all right, Mike, okay and he hooked me up and you know what it was it was like you know if you do drink alcohol and you have like a shot or one you know strong strong type spirit and you start feeling that burn well the minute he he hit me in the vein it just started going up my arm burning and then up my shoulder across my neck into my head across the rest of my body within a minute down to my feet and i was writhing in pain for seven days and I was praying to die. I was the seventh rescuer in six months to come down with the rarest leukemia there is. There's only 500 cases in all North America a year. And seven of us came down in six months. Two guys died during treatment. Seven responders, police fire. Two guys died in the first couple of days of the treatment because it's so vicious. Your liver, your heart, your kidneys, something will fail. And I was praying and I was praying, but I wanted to die. I was in so much pain. And I wouldn't take a painkiller because I, I know people with some issues and I, I just didn't want to go there. And finally, on the last day, I gave, I gave in. I said, oh, please, I, I can't do this anymore. I was literally like jumping out of my skin and they gave me something. But it had burned out my mind. It burned out my body. I couldn't hear. I could barely see. It was vicious. But it worked. And 
my nurses especially, they just they were so dedicated and devoted. And I and I was not an easy patient because I was in a lot of pain. It was it was bad. And it was drove my friends, my family crazy. It was, it was just it wasn't good. But on that first night, I had a quick vision of, of all these people that I loved that were dead, that died. A lot of them in the trade center. And I saw Johnny, I saw I saw friends I grew up with. The last one was my my mother-in-law who had passed six months before and she died of, she was in a coma, she had a stroke. She had a horrible, horrible last six months of life and it wasn't fair because she was so religious. She went to church every day, devout Catholic woman. And all of a sudden I see her and she's smiling. And uh, we used to talk a lot, you know, it's the Irish thing, like the gab, the gift of gab. And uh, she used to call me her boyfriend because we'd sit and talk for hours and talk about <laughs> books and about movies and about food. And I loved her. She was my friend. And she'd say, you know, my boyfriend's here. And, and all of a sudden she's smiling and she goes, hi, my boyfriend. And I said, no, 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 what are you doing? She goes, he's not ready. He doesn't want you. You got to go back. You got things to do. And I'm like, no, nah, nah, it hurts so much. Please, please take me. And she laughed. She goes, no, no, not yet. I'll see you. And she just faded away. And one of my doctors on my team, she she was, she had she had a problem with religion. And that's okay. I understand that. You know, I'm not a I'm not a preacher. I have a faith, but I don't preach it. I don't push it. I just, you know, live and let live. So she sent in this shrink to see me. And I and I was messed up from the chemo, but I, I, I knew what I was seeing. I knew what I was saying. And he was he was a Jewish gentleman. He was a, a rabbi also mm -hmm. in, in a synagogue. And I actually had responded in that district and he he knew 114 would run into Borough Park. And, oh yeah, I see Tally Ho, they come down the street, you know. <laughs> and he asked me to tell him the story and I did. And uh, he started laughing and he scared me now. I said, Doc, am I really crazy? He said, no, no. He said, I believe you, my friend. He said, we we share the same God. He goes, we, we work in the same corporation, but in different departments, <laughs> right? And different he says, he like says you, you did see your mother-in-law. He says, your faith is that strong. He said, I've had many patients express the same sentiments. He said, so I want you to listen to her and fight and be strong. And he said, so what else do you want to talk about? I said, well, I don't know, Doc, am I that messed up? He goes, no, no. He goes, they're paying me for an hour. It only took 20 minutes. <laughs> so we watched the Yankee game together. And nice. that's the last, you know. <laughs> but but it was just, again, it showed the human condition. Here, here's these two men of two totally different faiths. And yet we shared that that bond of faith. And he had empathy and he had sympathy. And he he, he saw me and many other patients. So he just didn't assume. And he and he gave me a fair shake, and I and I will always be grateful to him for that. Through any of this, the the pain you had to go through with the leukemia, but also the the days of nine eleven and after, did your faith get challenged? You know, Lex, it was strange. I, I, it was times I was so angry. You know, there's that range of emotions: the anger, the denial, the depression, the this, the that. And this is the weirdest thing. It was. It was mostly, I knew my career was over. And uh, they retired me out of the job. That, that October, I got sick in August and that October, they told me I was out. And by the time I was processed and you know used up my, my leaves and whatever you wanna say it was, I was, I was officially retired in January of 02. And uh, it was less than six months. And I'm there walking my dog one day, my rescue greyhound who I miss, she was such a soul. God, she lived to be almost 13, Katie. And uh, we're walking in the snow and I got the call, I was retired and I looked at her and I'm like, Katie, what am I gonna do? And she just looked up and said, we're gonna go on a lot more walks, you know? <laughs> and I was so sad and I was so sad. I was so angry because I lost my priesthood. I loved helping people, I really, mm -hmm. like I would have done it for free. I would never tell Mayor Bloomberg that, right? He, he, he's all about the buck, right? But like, you know, I, honestly, I would have, I would have been a New York City fireman. I would have paid them to do it. Yeah, you know, and uh, I wasn't allowed anymore. That's it. You, you have over twenty years, and you have cancer. You know, back when my dad got sick, they'd let you hang around for ten, twelve years in an office, but yeah. not now. Now it's all about the bottom line. And uh, but I was more depressed about losing a job than almost losing my life. Like as crazy as that sounds, you know, and it just, uh, 
it was more than a job. I mean, it's uh, it's a way of oh, life. Oh man, it's, yeah. it's, it's also as your family, your father. You're you're carrying the torch of your father's. Oh my friend, I love my friends. I, mean, I love. We work twenty four hour shifts together. You cook, you clean, you break each other's yeah. jobs relentlessly. <laughs> I mean, it was. I love those guys so much. I mean, I I hope that my kids and anyone that I know and care about, I hope they can experience the bond of that brotherhood that I experienced in my life. It was so, God, I, I, I would give anything to have it back. Just, yeah. 